Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the 19th meeting of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Uh, members in the, and the public should turn off mobile phones and Blackberries as leaving them in flight mode or on silent will affect the broadcasting system. Uh, I'll turn to agenda item one. Um, and uh, it's a declaration of interest. I would invite Angus MacDonald to declare any relevant interests. Thank you, um, Convener. Uh, I have no registrable interests to declare. However, uh, I should uh, perhaps mention that I have a background in farming, uh, livestock auctioneering and wholesale and retail butchering through family businesses in the Western Isles. So I hope I can bring some of that knowledge to the committee. Thank you for that. And we welcome you to the committee. Uh, and uh, sad to say that we've uh, lost Dennis Robertson uh, and uh, uh, we thank him for his work and also for Mr Q for here, keeping here. us uh, organised and uh, here, indeed here. entertained. Um, so thanks to them in their new roles. Uh, agenda item two, Scottish Rural Development Programme. It's first uh, agenda item this morning for the committee to hear uh, about the SRDP from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, and for the benefit of the official report and those in the public gallery, the Scottish Scotland Rural Development Programme will be referred to uh, in this and future meetings under the acronym SRDP. Uh, as we have the Cabinet Secretary here, we'll also take the opportunity to ask a few questions on the Common Agriculture Policy, hereafter known as the CAP. Um, <laughs> but uh, we would welcome uh, Richard Lockhead, the Cabinet Secretary, and invite him uh, to int introduce his officials to now. Good morning, Habse. Good morning, and it's uh, good to be back before the committee, first time in, uh, since summer recess. And I particularly welcome to Angus MacDonald, who's joined your committee. Uh, it's a uh, welcome opportunity to discuss with the committee the Scotland Rural Development Programme and also answer any questions, of, of which I'm sure there are many, on the current CAP negotiations. Uh, on my left, far left-hand side, we have Drew Sloan, who's the Chief Agricultural Officer. On my immediate left is David Barnes, who's Deputy Director of the Rural Directorate and is uh, a key figure in the CAP negotiations, as well as the SRDP as well. And on my right is Jonathan Price, the Director of the Rural Directorate. Uh, so that's my colleagues who hopefully will be helping me out today with any particularly tough questions you ask. Um, I suspect that we should just fire on to the questions and uh, we can expand on, on these in due course. I'd like to kick off uh, as to ask the Cabinet Secretary if uh, you believe that the decrease in funding will have any impact on the outcomes expected from the SRDP. <clears throat> well, well, thanks. That's uh, obviously a very important question. It's quite a general question as well. And in terms of the budget for the SRDP, uh, as I've explained before to the committee, the budget, of course, has fluctuated since 2007. And, of course, there was a delay kicking off the SRDP in that there was a, a, a year's delay in getting the go-ahead from Europe for our rural development programme, which was an issue impacted many countries. And, then, of course, once we opened for applications, and I think it was about around 2008, then the money didn't start getting out the door until some point after that. Uh, so we've had to manage all these uh, budget issues over the last few years. On top of that, we have had, of course, the spending review and uh, the cuts by Westminster to the Scottish budget, which has impacted in all portfolios, including my own. Uh, and we've had different fluctuations in the exchange rate, which also influences the budgets available within the SRDP. However, saying that, I'm confident that we have generally met demand across the SRDP over the last few years. Uh, one issue which, of course, has commanded a lot of attention uh, among certain NGOs and, and this committee uh, and the media is the agri-environment schemes. And, of course, we have kept a close eye on that budget to ensure it is generally in line with demand. So the most recent uh, application round for agri-environment schemes, which was causing concern because people were interpreting our different budget for this year compared to last year as a massive cut, it was actually calculated and based on what we expected demand to be from agri-environment schemes. And whilst the most recent round is still being analysed in terms of which applications will be successful, I did ask officials for an estimate of how many applications would be successful, and we're talking about between 70 uh, uh, and 75%, give or take. We won't know the final figure, of course, until each application's got a result. 
which is generally in line with previous years. So, so to be fair, I think my prediction that there would be enough in the pot to meet general demand from agri-environment schemes uh, was relatively close to the mark in that up to now there's been a 70% to 80% success rate for agri-environment schemes and the most recent round should be roughly in line with that. So uh, I don't think it's fair to say that any cut in the budget uh, has had a massive impact on the number of schemes will get the go-ahead from agri-environment. We'll probe that in, in uh, okay. some more detail, but um, I'd like to take you back to the point that, uh, you know, once a year the Scottish Government has the opportunity to apply to vary the co-financing rate uh, with regard to many of these schemes. Um, what's been your approach in the last year to this opportunity? Okay. Um, I'll ask colleagues to come in a second for the actual figures for co-financing, but clearly, again, returning to my theme of the challenges, and I'm not underestimating how massive these challenges have been of ma managing the SRDP budget uh, over the last few years, uh, that, that's been heavily influenced by the co-financing rate. So in the earlier years of the SRDP, there was more domestic funding available, so we had a case for drawing down less euros uh, in co-financing, uh, because quite clearly we're looking across the whole five or seven years of the programme. Uh, but in the last year or two, we've increased the co-financing rate to make sure, on the one hand, we use up as much of, as possible of the, the European contribution to the SRDP, and on the other hand, because of our own financial position with our Scottish budget, we've, had, you know, we've wanted to make the most of the European element because we've had less domestic element available. Uh, so that's been our, our trend over the last few years, is to increase the co-financing rate to maximise the European contribution. Because clearly, as the programme draws to an end, and that's where we are at the moment, we want to be in a position by the end of the programme where we've drawn down the European element of, of the funding and made the most of that opportunity, uh, notwithstanding the fact that may impact in the future allocations to Scotland of SRDP funding, so we want to uh, use all our European contribution. But in terms of the actual co-financing rates, can I ask colleagues maybe to give a bit of indication, maybe Jonathan will do that. Yeah, in <coughs> it was December last year that we increased the co-financing rate. Um, and on average, we moved it from uh, roughly 50% uh, of European funding um, to 63%. To That's an average figure across. It's made up of um, gen generally some payments that are co-financed at 55% and some that are co-financed at 100%. Okay. Um, and, uh, that's what it's possible for more people to apply then uh, for the areas that that money is, is uh, drawn down for. Well, yes, it's just helped us really, to be quite frank, cope with a difficult budget position in Scotland uh, in that we can make each, <coughs> if I can use the phrase, Scottish pound, uh, go further in terms of uh, getting the match funding from Europe. Thank you, um, Annabel Ewing and then Graham Day. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I just wonder how, if you could uh, give... Um, to the committee information, as to, if, if you have it, as to where we stand in terms of SRDP funding at the European end uh, as compared with other member states. Do we receive a reasonable amount <coughs> compared to other member states? Are we at a much higher level or are we at a much lower level in terms of the averages? Well, the level of Pillar 2, as it's referred to under the cap negotiations funding, which is the rural development regulations as opposed to the direct payments that go to farmers, uh, which is clearly where the SRDP gets the majority of its funding from, uh, then it's been a long-running sore that we get the lowest level within the UK for Pillar 2 and we get the lowest level within Europe. So not only at the 27 member states do we get the lowest level of Pillar 2 funding, but within the UK, we get the lowest level of funding, so we are the bottom of the bottom of the league. And that is for historical reasons, uh, just in terms of the uh, lack of priority attached to rural funding by previous UK governments, which gave us a very low starting point. So as you can imagine, this is a key point for the future negotiations, or the current negotiations over the new cap where we are arguing that objective criteria should be used for the future Pillar 2 allocations and not just historic, uh, because clearly that would advantage Scotland. If objective criteria were used for uh, the new cap, we would gain Pillar 2 funding 
over and above what we get just now. Difficult to say exactly how much, but quite clearly uh, objective criteria would put Scotland in a much better place. Um, so clearly that is a big priority and I think you'll find all the stakeholders, whether that be you know, rural organisations or agricultural organisations or environmental NGOs, are all uh, at one with the Scottish Government and indeed Parliament and this committee arguing for better Pillar 2 allocations uh, through the new cap. Someone enlighten me as, as to what is the maximum percentage input from the EU? I mean, we're at 63% now. Is that as, as high as it can go? And also, what is the overall size of the SRDP at the moment? In terms of the co-financing rate, I think I'm right in saying that it varies depending on the schemes. In some schemes, you're allowed to give X percent, and other schemes, you're allowed to give up to 100%, which is European funded fully, uh, and you don't need a domestic contribution. So it, it basically varies across the, the schemes. Yeah, it does. We, we're, we're, we're pretty close to the maximum that we could extract from, um, from Europe in terms of the funding. In terms of the size of the SRDP, do you want to elaborate on what you want to know there? Sorry. <coughs> Just, I mean, I think the it was an estimate of £1.2 billion. Is that accurate? Or? Yeah, uh, roughly £1.2 billion is what we'd expect to be the final figure from SRDP expenditure. Uh, over the course. Uh, no doubt that would have been more if we'd managed to get the SRDP off the ground more quickly uh, because, as I said before, there was effectively a two-year delay at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We lost the year because of Europe's bureaucratic um, machine uh, taking ages to give the go-ahead to various member states' programmes. And then, of course, by the time you opened applications and start paying out the money, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was further time lost. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, we may face a similar situation with the new SRTP as well, but we'll try and avoid that as much as possible. But that's largely out of our hands. Google. The convener, and um, you've partly answered um, the question I was going to ask, which is, you know, we have, according to the paper we have, it's now 1.2 billion that you know the likely funding that we'll have, which is 0.4 billion less than originally. Now you. You're saying it's totally because of the, the lateness in actually getting into the that financial year, or is it lost no, money because of the yeah. co-financing? Sure. Because yeah. No, I'm not saying it's totally because of that reason. I don't want to give that impression. I, I, I certainly don't want to do that. That's certainly a, a, a big reason, but it's not the only reason. Uh, there was various figures banded about in the early years of the SRDP. I inherited the SRDP. The committee will remember the story, which is we came into government in May 2007. The SRDB had to be with Europe by June 2007. We only had time to make one amendment to it, which was putting the new entrance scheme into it, because we felt that was a priority. And uh, clearly at that point, the figure that's been banded about uh, with the SRDP, which we, we took on in good faith, was that this could potentially deliver up to £1.6 billion for Scotland. Uh, clearly that's not going to be the case for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is the loss of time at the beginning. So we basically lost one or two years' budgets. Uh, secondly, we've had budget cuts over the course of this uh, programme over the last two parliaments. As you know, the capital expenditure has been cut by 30% by Westminster. That's an impact on the SRDP as it has across government. Uh, and thirdly, the exchange rate. I suspect the figures early on were calculated in the best possible exchange rate. And of course, the exchange rates fluctuated over the last uh, few years. So it's I put my hands up and say it's very difficult to pinpoint which factor accounts for how much of that gap in some of the estimates early on, but a combination of these factors has led to uh, where we are today. So, um, in previous years, is that what has happened? There's been fluctuations and it would appear that you know the losses to uh, our budget in Scotland because of these issues that you have mentioned? Or uh, yes, I mean, yes, that is the case, but I mean, there's, an, there's a whole other range of factors I could mention. For instance, we found that uh, during, well, if you recall, the recession hit the world mm -hmm. uh, and Scotland and the UK and Europe, uh, 2008, particularly 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. And what we found then was all we can do through the SRDP, particularly the Rural Priorities Funding, because that's the one that's fluctuates the most, is make offers. So we get applications from businesses want to expand, we make offers. 
And what we found a lot of the time was companies were not taking up the offers. So we end up with underspends because we can't recommit that money to other people because we made a, a pledge to one particular business. Mm -hmm. The business goes to the bank. The bank won't lend them the money because of all the changes that have happened with the economic situation or just the general economic situation is impacting that particular business. So we end up with um, lots of businesses getting awards from SRDP but not taking them up. And that gives us a massive headache in managing the budgets because we give them as much time as we can. But if you've offered a company, in some cases, a million pounds for an expansion project and they don't take it up, you're left with that budget heading. And we try to manage that as much as possible by, by overcommitting. So we've tried to judge that in the early years mm -hmm. or the experience of the early years reflecting that the latter years where you say, well, we'll overcommit because we expect some companies not to accept the rewards. And you're constantly trying to, to balance that. So that's another factor. Yes, but the bottom line is, I have to make this clear, that you know, we're talking about uh, up to £1.2 billion, pounds, hopefully, or one point one between £1.1 and £1.2 billion pounds going out the door to rural Scotland. That's made a massive difference to a whole lot of businesses. And, you know, you're talking of hundreds of millions of pounds being pumped into expansion projects involving a lot of businesses. Can I, sorry, could I just continue? Yes, continue? Yeah, please. Um, you know, you mentioned that because of the actual size of some of these projects, you know, about a million or around a million pounds, would it not then be better to consider more smaller projects? Yes, that's a good point, and we did that. So we changed SRDP a couple of years ago to uh, give more applications, uh, you know, a bite of the cherry, I guess, and we put a cap on the grants for certain schemes. So that, that's helped greatly ensure that more companies benefited from it. And this committee expressed views on that in the past, and we took that on board, as it did stakeholders. So again... Uh, the SRDP is a massive scheme, and we've learned a lot of lessons, which hopefully we can take into the new SRDP. But capping was a major issue, and we introduced that. Indeed, I like Ferguson. Could I, could I maybe just continue this discussion a little bit, if I may? Because I, I think the cabinet secretary has mentioned a very important this, uh, part of this, what seems to be one of the, 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 the difficulties in the current SRDP, which, as I'm sure he is aware, that there are many, many small farmers and small businesses uh, small rural businesses that have had real difficulty of accessing um, current SRDP. Um, and one of the questions that I get asked quite a lot by some people who have perhaps just not managed to get the necessary number of points in trying to uh, access some of the competitive parts of the scheme is, is that where the exact instance that you've just pointed out, where maybe a, a large business has had a very large award made to it, but it's not been taken up, that resource is basically then, in theory at least, available and the, the question I have really is why, or are, are, what difficulties are there in reassessing in that event, and you suddenly find you've got a million pounds available that you had previously um, allocated, what difficulties exist in, in revisiting some of the businesses, some of the criteria that have perhaps just prevented an application being successful, uh, and looking at them again with a view to reallocating that money? There have been a number of occasions, because I have wrestled with this, believe me, <laughs> a lot, where we, I, I've personally intervened to reduce a number of the larger grants to bring more of the lower scores into the, into the successful applications. And that has benefited a range of businesses across Scotland, my personal intervention, where I've, I get my recommendations. And clearly, I can't investigate every single recommendation I get, but I've looked at the bigger ones, and I've looked at the ones that have just missed out under the scoring. And in... The majority of the last couple of years' rounds, I've personally intervened to redistribute some of the larger grants where I felt that's not justified, or I've asked for these to be reappraised by Scottish Enterprise and other agencies uh, to, to make the, the cash go further to help other businesses. So I have done that, uh, and that has benefited a number of businesses in Scotland. However, if you even look at your representations you've had, I think, either in connection with this evidence session or, or previously from the NFU amongst others, they have said they want the future of the SRTP still to support transformational projects. And the original aim of the SRTP was to uh, tick a number of boxes, but one of these objectives, which many people signed up to, was it should be transformational. So if you're going to transform businesses or sectors, clearly that's where a lot of the large grants uh, were being applied for. Because if you have 
you know, tens of thousands of small grants, that may be transformational once you lump it all together, but most uh, of the thinking was that you want to have transformational projects, and they are by nature very expensive projects. So 40% of an £8 million project you know, amounts to several million pounds. So that's why the big grants were there in the first place, to be transformational. And the original objective of the SRDP before I inherited it was that it should be transformational. So we're all trying to ride these two horses of supporting smaller businesses, but supporting transformational projects at the same time. I understand that, and I'm grateful for that explanation. But it can be just as transformational, surely, for a small business, say a small farmer, to put in a new cattle handling facility. It may be so transformational, it might save his life, actually, um, as it is for a, a, a huge sort of industrial farmer to, to build a brand new dairy complex. Um, who, who determines the, the definition of transformational is really what I'm asking. You know. Well, we have the, the regional assessment committees and, you know, Dumfries and Galloway has its own committee and it looks at the applications from there and many large grants have gone to Dumfries and Galloway, particularly for dairy businesses, which you referred to. And that's because the local, local RPAC, as we call them, the regional assessment committees, uh, look at the regional needs and the dairy sector is extremely important to South West Scotland. Therefore, they've said we want to be transformational about the future of the dairy sector and they then therefore give recommendations to me saying substantial grants to go to the ex-business because it'll be transformational. So that's really where the definition comes from, is from the, uh, the local advice, local expertise in those areas. In the case of Dumfries and Galloway, the dairy sector seen as something we should support because it's transformational for that area. That same RPAC tells me that their hands are largely tied in how they go about distributing the, 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 the money available. This is perhaps jumping on to another section. Of Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. Can be oh, it, we will certainly take it forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and the remarks that you made are, are valuable in that. But I, I think we should stick with the demand for the... Sorry. Uh, Sorry, my question is Okay, good. Uh, the demand for the SRDP funding. Jim Hume, first of all. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Minister, Cabinet Secretary, I should say. Um, in our notes, it clearly states, and you've agreed, that we've seen the SRDP budget reduced from 1.6 to £1.2 billion, which is a reduction of about, I suppose, 40%. But previously and today, you've already, already stated that uh, you've tailored the budgets to meet the demand, um, which may be the case or not. But uh, I know RSPB were quite critical of the budget last year stating that um, the demand has, in their words, been manipulated. One of the most popular criteria was, of course, hedging, and that's been taken out. And, and therefore, the criteria that is left, there is, isn't uh, enough, um, enough for applicants to apply for. Therefore, they are not, not applying. I wonder how you would uh, react to that. It's a point I think I brought up before with you at the committee. Well, it's an important point. I'm sure we can debate the definition of demand till the cows come home, forgive the, the pun, but the budgets work in a way in which one year's budget not only covers the applications for that year, but covers the demand from previous year's awards. So we try to explain in the clearest terms possible <laughs> to the environmental NGOs that the agri-environment budgets are set by previous year's awards. So the 2011-12 budget, for instance, and then if you're comparing that to the 2012-2013 budgets, but the 2011-12 budget took into account schemes that were finishing that year from previous year's awards. Does that make sense? So you're coping with not just demand for the future, you're coping for demand from the past. So that leads to fluctuation because, you know, that's always going to change. And we tried to explain that it wasn't a cut in terms of we're going to spend X this year on agri-environment, on new schemes compared to last year, therefore there's a cut in the budget. It was if some schemes are coming to an end, they disappear off the budgets because they've come to an end and therefore your, your budget is set for demand at that point in time. I know that sounds quite convoluted and I'm not saying that we're not face facing financial constraints because ultimately you could argue if we're only giving 70% or 75% success rates for applications, there's unmet demand, because if you give 100%, well, yes, but with competitive schemes, you're never always going to be able to give 100% of grants out. So that's what we're trying to manage, and that's the, we, we try to give comfort to the environmental organisations, RSPB and others, to say that 
the success rate of applications is roughly in line with previous years. And we expect the most recent Agri Environment Round to be along similar lines in terms of the success rates to previous years. So we don't expect a massive fluctuation. So I think that shows we are hopefully meeting demand. I think we could probably argue till the cows went home on that. And yeah. There is an argument that that, that, that could see ever, an ever-decreasing circle of, of demand because if, uh, uh, if you're always looking back the way ra rather than forward the way. But, um, re regarding applications, you're seeing 70 to 80 per cent success rate. There are, uh, re rhetorically, of course, um, a lot of people put off because they, they can't see criteria that, that fits their businesses, if you like. And also, the, there, of course, there is the, the so-called traffic light system, red, uh, amber, green, etc. Many uh, applications at a very early stage are giving a red. I, I just wonder if the applications at the early stage are included in these per percentages, or is it just are you only including the ones that go through one or two stages to, to get the, the green? And also, obviously, the, the, the point I had regarding you know, those who are put off uh, applying altogether because of cost, time and uh, lack of uh, criteria suitable to their businesses? Well, I'll stand to be corrected by colleagues, but I, as far as I'm aware, the statistics relate to actual applications. Mm -hmm. So the traffic light system is there to help people so they can go away and adjust their application before they formally submit it. Mm -hmm. Because that, I think that's been helpful for a lot of businesses. And if a business gets a red, well, fair enough. At least they're being told there's no point going through the application process because so, so this ain't going anywhere. Those, those the the statistics out, yeah. refer to actual formal applications, not uh, expressions of interest. Mm -hmm. Do you have the statistics on the actual? Um, um, no, I'm happy to. I mean, I don't. I don't have that statistic, but I'm happy to see if that is available. That statistic. That would be useful but that's an advisory see. service. You know, it's, it's there to be helpful. If, I, I understand your point to maybe use that as a gauge of how many people are not proceeding to application stage, but mm -hmm. it's there to be helpful. I mean, it's... Well, I mean, if somebody's going to... Uh, I mean, you could argue that an application is, is at that early traffic light stage, uh, to use your own sort of uh, wording, because obviously once someone gets the red, that, that's, they'll probably either go back to the drawing board or maybe just forget the whole system already, bearing in mind they've probably spent quite a lot on, yeah. on um, help and need. Yeah, but to get to that stage? You know, we, we face the, the challenge of having to establish criteria for people that qualify for grant schemes. This is public money. It's there to deliver an outcome for Scotland. And clearly, if a business or an individual comes forward with an application which th does not meet that criteria, you know, I, I would hope the committee would accept they should not, you know, be given a grant from pub the public it, purse. It, so it's there for a purpose. Uh, uh, if we start... Uh, apologies, yes. If we start counting... Mm -hmm applications which do not meet criteria and are not in the public interest as unmet demand, then, you know, I think that's not reasonable because the whole purpose of that scheme is to tell people you don't meet the criteria. So I don't think that counts as genuine unmet demand because it's, it doesn't qualify. Chair, it would be uh, interesting for us to know because then that would show whether there was a, an interest in, in yes, no. engaging... If, if these statistics exist, and I'll have to check that, I'll happily send them to the committee. Okay. Um, and I just wonder, uh, through, through the chair again, of course, um, if, uh, if you have looked at the criteria for the, for the new um, SRDP already, uh, will that be similar to the one we have at the moment, or will it be a broadly different criteria? Well... Uh, Oh, have I, have I, questions have I, questions have I, apologies I, if I I'm happy to return to that. If, or no, I th think so. It will be covered later, so thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that just now. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Secretary, uh, could I ask you about, um, in relation to the SRDP, the very important issue of um, government bodies and others who are, are uh, raising awareness of an issue such as diffuse pollution and how much account is taken um, in relation to demand management and uh, in, in, in that context. For instance, if one looks at Eyemouth, where I was um, uh, in the summer, and farmers have been encouraged to look at uh, the problems of diffuse pollution and how they can deal with them, and then is there, is there account taken for the future of the possibilities of them applying for 
um, for SRDP in that context. Yes. We do take that into account and quite clearly we work closely with SEPA uh, as well as the industry on these issues <laughs> and you may have noticed there's been a significant number of slurry stores funded through the SRDP in recent years and that was a specific policy objective to improve Scotland's water quality and diffuse pollution. And as you know, there's been various regulations through the Water Framework Directive, etc., that have come into play in Scotland, which have, have caused a bit of controversy in some cases in terms of how we implement them. Uh, however, they're there for a good purpose, uh, as you say, to improve our, our water quality. So yes, we try and guide the budgets towards you know, outcomes in terms of environmental quality and, and particularly water quality. Can I follow up a bit more about the, the, the targeting of the programmes and so on? And uh, to pick up points that have been mentioned before, like rural priorities and environmental schemes, they're competitive, which means that small farmers may not be able to take advantage of uh, various schemes, especially environmental ones, simply because they're not big enough to score sufficient numbers of points. And conversely, large schemes get more. Now, we mentioned that transformational issues uh, are affected here, but we have a large number of small farmers, crofters and so on. Um, is the SRDP, um, you know, in, in the process, which is in the process of being rejigged, uh, uh, base, basing some of that rejig on uh, the experience of these last four years? in terms of the access that smaller farmers and crofters get? Yes, I am very keen to reflect on the experience of small farmers. And one of the issues which I want to fix is the fact that sometimes we have made changes that have addressed this, but I'm sure there's still perceptions of the case, and I want to, to address that, is you have to jump through the same hoops for a, you know, a £5,000 grant as a £500,000 grant, and we did make some changes to SRDP to address that, but I think perhaps there's still some issues to be dealt with there as part of the new SRDP. So I am very keen to address that. However, it is encouraging to see many of the schemes that have been funded for, for small farms and crofters, and I remember being in Lewis, I think about a year and a half ago, where I met a group of crofters who'd come together to have a joint application to the SRTP for a joint environment scheme involving all their crofts, which were clearly neighbouring crofts. Uh, and I think that's a good thing to encourage. So there are good examples out there of how uh, crofters and, and small farms are benefiting from the SRTP. Again, one of the very difficult debates, which I'm very keen on the committee's views, is you know, how do you divvy up the cake of the SRDP to be transformational? Uh, do you encourage lots of farmers to work together? Because quite clearly, 10 or 12 crofters working together on a large scheme is going to be a bit more transformational necessarily than supporting just one crofter in that particular area uh, and having lots of uh, different small farms or crofts being allocated small amounts of cash all around the country. But if you have these sort of collective schemes, it's much more of an impact. So that, you know, that's, a, that's a debate to be had, and I'm keen to have that. Yeah, I think we would be, uh, especially in farming areas, we're looking for farmers to cooperate with each other would be a useful um, development. Um, do you think, then, that the programmes are well targeted to meet the objectives that, that they have? And you know, just to finish this section about the funding of the SRDP. Well, it's more a philosophical point, but over the last three or four years, we should have some evidence. Unlike some of my counterparts from across the UK, I've been in this job now for <laughs> several years, and that gives me at least one benefit, which is I can reflect on the experience of doing this job uh, for several years and since the beginning of the SRDP. So I would be perfectly frank and say to the committee, I think the need, there's a need for some significant substantial changes to the Rural Development Programme. I think we can all point to fantastic success stories across the country. I visit farming businesses, food businesses, etc., as often as I can, environmental projects, and I hear time and time again how the Rural Development Programme has transformed businesses and projects, and that's really good news. But sometimes I think we have to stand back and look at the big picture across Scotland and see what the objectives are for the country, what the government's policies are, what the Parliament wants to see happen 
you know, as well as the general public. And I do think there are some major lessons to be learned. I think the next SRDP has to be a lot more focused um, around many less objectives. I think the all things to all people approach has been problematic and challenging to deliver. And I think there's massive opportunities for the rural economy, which will benefit all businesses and the environment by just focusing a lot more in the future of the Rural Development Programme and finding much more simpler ways of delivering the necessary support uh, to businesses and communities. So that's quite a general answer, but uh, I think it gives you an indication that I, I'm up for some radical surgery on the SRDP of the future. Um, I, I know the stakeholders may have alternative views. They want change, but they want it to be all things to all people in some cases. And we have to have that debate with our stakeholders about how to deliver these two sometimes competing objectives of having simplicity, but having a all singing, all dancing SRDP that don't go together. So we may have to sacrifice one to achieve the other. But that's a debate to be had just now. We're having that debate with stakeholders. I'd very much welcome the view of this committee over the coming months. Well, that's one for us to certainly major on in due course. Um, to pick up uh, the uh, arguments about the regional project assessment committees, um, start off with questioning with Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Cameron Sackett, can I ask, uh, what's the current pass score for applications as set by NPAC, and how does it compare to previous years? And I'd also like to explore, um, I, I understand the number of RPAC meetings per year has been reduced over the period. I just wonder what the plans are for 2013. Okay, there's, there's two issues there you've raised. Uh, firstly, the future of the SRDP. And we are now in the final stages of the SRDP. And from now on, there will not be many rounds of the SRDP. And where there are rounds, they will be very limited to particular, um, uh, particular schemes. So quite clearly, I think it's very important to continue ELFAS, which is part of the SRDP. I want to continue support for new entrants. And I want to find ways of continuing woodland grants to achieve our forestry targets. Uh, and there may be other areas that we want to, to continue. But other than that, we have to accept we're in the final stages of the budgets and the SRDP. Uh, and therefore, you know, that's just where we are. Um, the second point of your question was the scoring uh, criteria. Uh, well, clearly that changes by the number of applications because <laughs> you're using the scoring criteria to prioritise the better applications. So if there's 500 applications, you're going to have a higher threshold than what there are for 50, depending on the budget available. So that changes. But I'll ask uh, colleagues to come in on the scoring criteria, uh, <coughs> where we are at the moment with that. I don't know if, if David or John. Have you got the table there? I've got the, no, I've, I've, well, I've, got the, I've got the table for, um, for, the, for the criteria. The, the point is that um, it varies uh, across the different axes. Um, so if we take the, um, uh, if we take the latest um, round of business development, the, essentially the cutoff was um, 16 or 17. Um, some 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 projects fell into into that into that buffer gap, um, and uh, sixteen was sixteen was the cut off in um, two August two thousand and ten, um, and in September two thousand and eleven, although also with a with a buffer that was a little bit lower. So the scores have the scores have gone up a little, uh, but not not radically over the last couple of years. Agri environment the scores have been pretty static. Um, in 2010, 2011, forestry, very static, um, rising a bit on supporting rural, e rural enterprise and rising a bit on supporting rural communities. Um, but, but, it, uh, but as the Cabinet Secretary said, it depends on the number of applications and the amount of money available. Um, and it's worth saying that the, the actual spend, actual and forecast in last year, this year and next year, is as high as, it, high as it has ever been in, in the SRDP programme, this current programme. Yeah. The SRDP managed? Well, the LMOs, land management options, part of the SRDP um, 
is something which stakeholders demanded to be part of the SRDP. <laughs> uh, and now, I think in reflection, it's not been as successful as we'd have liked. Therefore, that no doubt will be one area for some surgery in terms of the new SRDP. So there's been a lack of demand for the LMOs. Um, again, perhaps that's one area of the SRDP where we were trying to make sure that there was something available for everyone. But, you know, you don't quite get these things right sometimes. Um, I don't know if, David, you, about the LMOs, you want to say a bit more about the LMOs? In terms of the non-competitive parts of the programme? Yes, the, the way the budget works is that rural priorities becomes the adjustment variable. So any uh, allocation for LMOs which isn't used up, if, if demand for LMOs is such that... Uh, that allocation isn't used, then that, auto that, that money isn't lost. It automatically becomes available for the rest of the programme, which in effect means rural priorities as the, as the adjustment variable. And, um, just to sort of go back to the previous point, are there any meetings planned for the uh, regional um, pr project assessment committees for 2013? Well, the number will depend on whether funding becomes available for further rounds of what they right. would deal with. In other words. Um, but in terms of what's scheduled at the moment, do we have dates? There won't, there won't be dates in the diary yet. No. Uh, do that again? Um, yeah, I can answer that. The, the dates for the following year have usually only been announced in October time, November. So there's, even if there, there was going to be some, they've not been announced in previous years at this point. Okay, um, we're moving on to the gap uh, between SRDP programmes and uh, Margaret McDougall is going to lead on this. It's believed that the process may take longer than planned and a new cap may not be ready at the start of 2014. While the direct support regulation could be extended to continuing funding the single farm scheme, the SRDP is a programme and has an end date of December 2013, which means that just rolling over the current scheme would be more difficult. Um, does the Scottish Government have a contingency plan for SRDP schemes should agreement on the cap be delayed? It's a very good question. A lot of people are asking a similar question at the moment, and indeed it's a question we're asking over and over to the European Commission, which is very frustrating because it's very difficult to get clarity over the, from the Commission uh, uh, on what assistance and arrangements will be put in place to fill the gap here. And indeed, I should just tell the committee that I'm meeting Commissioner Cholish tomorrow in Edinburgh uh, for a short while. Uh, he's here for, I think, a day's visit, and I have a meeting with him. And this is one issue I'll be raising with him tomorrow is we really need a lot more clarity and help from the Commission. This is not an issue just for Scotland. This is an issue, an issue which all Member States are raising at the moment with the European Commission, is what arrangements have been put in place for the gap here. However, I am confident that we will find a way in which LFAS payments continue, which is clearly a crucial lifeline for many uh, farming businesses in Scotland. Uh, and we will have to look at where domestic funding will have to come in to plug some of the gaps. That's also a big budget question for us, which we'll, we're working on at the moment. Uh, the availability of domestic funding will help me answer that question in the coming uh, months, because clearly if, if I can identify some domestic funding, I can just use that to keep certain schemes open, even if the European funding is not available. Uh, in terms of Elfast, though, which is a, the, the crucial issue here, we are seeking clarity from the European Commission that we can continue the existing LFAS scheme for a further year. I don't envisage any major obstacles, but until I see it in black and white from the Commission, you know, I have to continue to pursue that to make sure it's legally possible to issue LFAS payments uh, for that gap year of 2014. So uh, that's clearly a priority. I have said that I want to look at continuing the forestry grants and food processing grants, and also ensuring that new entrants still have some assistance available through the gap year as well. And there may be ways in helping leader as well. So these are kind of the issues I'd like to keep going for the gap year. 
Uh, but I, pre I appreciate it's quite an anxious time until we get some of the assurances and certainty into place. So, Wait a minute, Margaret's got follow-up. Yes, first. thank you. Uh, you did sort of touch on new entrants there, and, and they are one of the casualties when you have this sort of rolling on, and they've lost that opportunity to to come into the market. So, is there anything specifically that you are doing for new entrants to get them? In, because it is a five-year programme and, you know, quite often they just have a five-year tenancy if they're starting up. So it's just the difficulties around the new entrants in total. Um, yes. We had our new entrants summit last week, which was very successful, and we've set up an advisory panel for new entrants now in Scotland to help us with the cap negotiations, but also in wider issues to do with the... SRDP and any adjustments needs required or, or domestic funding uh, for any other schemes. So, you know, I'm paying close attention to that and maybe some initiatives we bring forward in the next few months. In terms of the remainder of this SRDP, I indicated before that one of my priorities I want to keep open is a new entrance scheme. So even if there's only three or four elements, we can continue for the remainder of this SRDP, this is not even talking about the gap year yet, we're just talking about this SRDP, I want to make sure new entrants still have some support available to them. And then in terms of the, the gap year, as I said, I want to make that a priority of finding ways in which we can keep support for new entrants during the gap year of, of the SRDP not being um, available from Europe. Alec Ferguson. Sorry, yes, thank you. you and I, I'm, 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 thank you, Convener. I'm delighted to hear that you're going to meet the Commissioner tomorrow and, and um, put up the case for continued LFAS payments. And obviously there are five-year agri-environment contracts that have been agreed that will require to be funded over that this gap year, should it exist. It may be more than a year. Who knows? Um, and, I, and as I say, I'm delighted you're going to meet the Commissioner. But can I ask what what steps you take as a government and uh, to, to go to Brussels to plead this case as well? Because I don't think we always have to wait for the Commissioner to come here. Um, and, and I just wonder if you could sort of detail for us what representations we actually make in Brussels, in, in the EU, to, to state the case for this. I can assure you uh, that we're putting a huge amount of effort into this very point. And I have raised this many, many times uh, over the last year or so in particular uh, with the Commission. Um, it's an issue, as I said before, that other member states are raising as well. We're not alone here. So I am raising this with the UK government. I have done various times, and I will continue doing that to get their support, because clearly it's an issue of concern to them as well. Uh, I will raise it tomorrow with the Commissioner. I raised it with the Commissioner when we met in Wales in uh, late July, early August. And you know, I've raised it many other opportunities. So please rest assured it's, a, it's an absolute priority for us. Uh, along with actual changes to the cap proposals on the table at the moment, uh, we've also been raising this, uh, and there's various working groups which officials are on where this is being discussed at the moment in terms of trying to get a bridging mechanism for that gap year. This all boils down to the fact that despite some of the assurances we've had from the Commission, we do not expect cap uh, to be ready to implement in Scotland until 2015. And I think we have to be very clear about that. Uh, we are not in a position to implement the cap, as are many other member states, in 2014. Therefore, we have to now prepare for that gap year. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. It's, it's again on, on the same point. Um, you, you mentioned two or three th things you would like to see continued in the gap year or, or potentially gap years. Uh, such as LFAS, of course, which I think would be essential, new entrants and uh, forest, forestry, etc. But is there anything stopping yourselves as, you know, as a regional government? You, you can do that, obviously, by going directly to the uh, European Union for a, a far fuller uh, agri-environmental scheme, a, a, as is a, at the moment, so that you can see the continuation of uh, businesses continuing with their, their good work uh, in that gap year or two. Firstly, we are looking at agri-environment schemes in terms of uh, bridging funding as well. I'm not in a position to say where that will end up in terms of the size of the budget, but we do recognise that rather than having some schemes come to an abrupt end, we want to continue that so they can continue through the gap year. So that is one of my priorities. I should have perhaps mentioned that when I was talking about new entrants and, and other 
priorities. So there's four or five issues there we're looking at, but that is one of them. Uh, and, you know, we are making the, the argument to Europe that they should be putting in place a, a bridging mechanism so we can continue agri-environment schemes with European funding and other schemes as well. Um, the biggest constraint I have as a national government is uh, budgets. You know, we obviously, if we have to pull in domestic funding to plug a gap, that puts an extra burden on our domestic budgets uh, by definition. So that's a, that's a big challenge. And that will limit to what extent we can plug the gap of the year. So we will not be able to plug it for all the schemes. We have to prioritise. And I've tried to give you an indication of where our thinking is going at the moment. Through the chair again, of course. Uh, but but sh surely keeping the European uh, budget going, if you like, by putting a, a, a full plan to, you, to Europe for that bridging gap year or years, uh, then perhaps that, that would uh, attract European funding and not necessarily put any extra strain on any uh, UK budget or Scottish budget. But we are doing that, but I think mm -hmm. the question before you was, is there a contingency plan? And the contingency plan I'm trying to explain to you is what we do in Scotland if there is no help from Europe. So our first priority is to get Europe to continue for an extra year these funding streams. But I was asked about the contingency plan, and my contingency plan is, yes, we do have a contingency plan, which is we'll have to um, you know, find domestic resources to at least keep some of our priority schemes going to some extent uh, through the gap year. So please rest assured, their first priority, as is, is the case with other member states, is to persuade the Commission there has to be an arrangement in place for that gap year, because on the one hand, they're arguing they will meet their current timetable for the new cap. <coughs> On the other hand, 27 member states are saying, no, you won't. <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to persuade uh, Europe to fill that gap year. Annabelle Yui. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just on, on that point, I mean, obviously, um, you know, it's interesting to hear some of the unionist members of the committee seeking a greater direct role for Scotland in, in Brussels, which I think is terrific. No. But it has to be remembered. Oh, they're recanting already. But it has to be remembered, of course, that the, it's the UK at the moment that is the... Uh, member state with the seat at the, the top table. And uh, I, I just wonder, therefore, if we could seek clarity as to what the UK government is currently doing to seek continuation of funding uh, for the whole of the UK, although I guess in terms of what they've managed to negotiate in the past, as we've heard on SRDP, where we have the lowest funding in the UK and the lowest funding in, in the European Union, perhaps we shouldn't set too much store on the UK's ability to negotiate for us. Uh, about this key issue, but it would be helpful if the, the CAPSEC could clarify what the UK government is doing to secure the key issue of continuation of, of funding in light of the likely delay in the CAP being secured. Well, clearly this was an issue I raised with the previous DEFRA team, who are now all gone, uh, and I'm meeting the new DEFRA team for the first time, hopefully. I assume they're attending and we're trying to set these details up at the moment, on Monday in Brussels at the Council. There's a Council next week, and that will be my first opportunity to meet the new DEFRA team face to face, and clearly this is one of the issues which I hope to have their support on. Uh, the indication from the previous team was, of course, this is an issue for England and Wales as much as it is for Scotland. However, my concern would be that the UK government's approach so far has to be to save budgets and cut budgets at every opportunity. And therefore, I suspect this is more of a priority for Scotland than it is for uh, the UK government, because if there's any excuse for saving funds and cutting budgets, even for a year, uh, that may be something they want to take advantage of. And I'll be trying to persuade them otherwise that we have to get the maximum support from Europe for the SRDP uh, through the gap year. So I'll be in a much better position to tell the committee uh, what the view is of the new DEFRA team uh, after uh, next week. Answer. I mean, obviously, it, it would be, uh, in my view, uh, better if we could just uh, take control of the situation ourselves uh, and ensure that our priorities were at the very top of the agenda, which would not therefore uh, accept any cut in funding, which may well be the way that the UK government is going on this specific issue. But I guess there'll be other issues about the cap that come up, convener, uh, a wee bit later in this morning's discussions. We, we probably should indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, I don't want to prolong this, but I think we have to accept that the, the political differences that exist between our various parties. But I, I, I'm not going to have it stated that, that uh, 
I'm not going to have words put into my mouth, which has just been done. What I actually was asking the Cabinet Secretary about was what representations he is making as part of the Scottish Government uh, directly to Europe, and I don't think that is... Uh, um, I, I don't think that is out of the way in any, in any state or form. The, the Scottish Government has absolute right to make representation directly to Europe. I was asking what representations had been made. You've made your point. Thank you. Um, we're still talking about reviewing and monitoring the SRDP uh, and a few more questions in that direction, perhaps. Um, if, uh, the, uh, uh, if there are uh, any other details that uh, your vast array of officials can dig into for us. Uh, Dick Lyle, you a question? Yes, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. The committee wrote to the Scottish Government to request information on work undertaken to review the operation of the SRDP 2007-13. Uh, the response that the committee got laid out four projects. First stage review of the SRDP, the mid-term evaluation of the SRDP, implementation review carried out by RSPB Scotland, and the project measuring the natural heritage outcomes. Can you inform the committee how the recommendations of the review projects have been taken into account in design of the new SRDP, and also inform the committee regarding the further details on the project measuring the natural heritage outcomes? Um, as the as, as you refer to, there is a monitoring committee which is there as part of the SRDP, which meets on a, a regular basis throughout the whole of the SRDP. And as part of the, the regulation, we have to have midterm reviews, etc., of the programme. And clear your questions over the four projects are quite detailed, and I'd happily write to the committee afterwards, perhaps with some feedback on the various recommendations and where they're being taken. Uh, but at the moment, we are engaged with all the stakeholders uh, through these committees on the future of the SRDP. Uh, clearly, the pace at which that happens will be guided by what the regulation will look like. Uh, so we have to agree the regulations with Brussels, which is part of this cap negotiation process, and then we have a separate debate in Scotland about how we want to implement that in Scotland, because there will be lots of flexibility. So we will have to decide once we know the boundaries of what we can do through the EU regulations, how we implement that uh, in Scotland. So that's a lot of work still to happen. Um, and I gave an indication earlier on, perhaps, of where I think that should take us with the new SRDP. Uh, in terms of the environmental outcomes, I'm happy to write back to the committee uh, on that. I don't know if any colleagues are closely involved with that at the moment. So if the committee is happy, can I write back to, to you on the results of the uh, environmental uh, assessments. Yep. Okay, Claudia Beamish. Cabinet Secretary, um, in view of um, really right across Europe, the failure to meet the um, biodiversity targets uh, in, in, in recent years and the aims to, to improve on that, you know, across Europe, I'm wondering uh, particularly, in, and I appreciate that you're going to write in detail uh, about the, the four uh, different ways in which the SRDP is being evaluated, but I wonder particularly in relation to biodiversity targets, if you could, just so it's on record at committee, just make any comment about uh, that, the significance of that and the measurements that are being made, and I understand that the project will... Um, report in three years and it will report in the interim six monthly so uh, I wonder if you could comment on that at all. Well the, the first point to make is that I, I fully support the new cap playing its role in trying to help uh, our respective countries achieve their biodiversity targets and the 2020 vision. Uh, as you said states fail to achieve their, their previous targets, that perhaps tells us something. Uh, we can take the easy route and just criticise countries for not putting enough effort into achieving our biodiversity targets, which may be the case in some areas, or we can look at what the causes are of uh, biodiversity impacts, and that clearly is climate change and other issues. And, and I have this ongoing debate in my head about, you know, are we focusing on the right measures to achieve our biodiversity targets? If we um, set down targets of protecting various species and habitats, which is important to do for obvious reasons, they can be swamped by climate change. 
and therefore we have to make sure we're targeting the right areas of government policy. So that's why I think our climate change targets are so important. And that takes me on to the greening debate of the cap, where climate change, in my book, is not featuring nearly highly enough. Uh, you know, we're having a greening debate over cap, and we're talking about what crops should be grown, or how many crops should be grown in each individual farm in Europe. But we're not talking about the carbon impact of agriculture enough. So to me, we've not quite got that right in terms of the European debate. We should be talking about the carbon impact of agriculture and then trying to focus on that as much as some of these other um, abstract targets that uh, the Commissioner seems to be speaking about in terms of greening the cap. So I'm trying to inject that into the greening debate at the moment, is saying to the Commission, when we're talking about greening the cap, we should be talking about a low-carbon cap and uh, take that into account when farmers are greening their their their, their farming, not just the amount of crops they've got and how many areas are put aside for, for set aside or, or ecologically focused areas. It should be what are we doing to reduce the carbon footprint of agriculture? To me, that's a priority. Cabinet Secretary, um, in terms of the SRDP, it's been suggested that uh, projects regarding soil and peatlands have often had to go via. Uh, the forestry route to be considered in the past. Um, we were questioning uh, on carbon accounting Professor Jan Bevington last week in the committee. In uh, column 1065, she said in answer to me, it's important to understand carbon stores, particularly those on Scottish soils, not just in the peatlands, but in other soil structures. I, I'm not a soil scientist, but I talked to soil scientists who tell me that that is where a lot of big money is at on big carbon and that keeping it locked away is the key. Can you say that in the review and monitoring that we're finding ways for people to access the SRDP uh, to achieve these kinds of outcomes? Well, we are keen for that to be part of the new SRDP and we recognise that said. Uh, protecting Scotland's precious peatlands is now much higher up the agenda and clearly is a key part of our climate change strategy in this country. Uh, so I am keen to ensure that is built into future support. It's not just about the SRDP, of course. It's a, a wider issue over carbon offsetting, etc., and we have to uh, make sure that it's part of the wider you know, climate change debate in Scotland. I know there's a lot of really good thinking going on just now, and I know, Convener, you're heavily involved in some of those debates. Uh, so there's a lot of active thinking taking place just now in the government, and I'll be happy to ensure you're updated on that very soon. That's helpful. Thanks, because uh, clearly uh, the access to money in that direction, which people have tried to get in the past, perhaps uh, could uh, have been more direct. And uh, I hope that in the monitoring of this, we'll hear how the SRDP has played its, past, uh, its part so far uh, in accessing money for peatland and soils. Okay. Um, totally agree, yeah. Right, I think we should move on to the cap. We still have time to discuss that. Um, we're coming to the new cap and um, we're looking at uh, the effects of uh, this on uh, the future of farming, forestry, etc. And uh, I'd like to ask Annabel Ewing to kick off on this. Thank you, Convener. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously our debate this morning has touched on the cap really as we've gone through because obviously it is a uh, direct impact. But... Fortunately, we've got some time left in this morning's session to look at other substantial issues concerning the cap, and I'm sure all members around the table would have particular questions. But the Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, alluded earlier in, in this morning's session to the UK DEFRA reshuffle, and it seems to me that the Cabinet Secretary must now be the most experienced, not just fisheries uh, minister in the whole of the British Isles, but probably now agricultural minister in, in the whole of the British Isles, and I would hope, therefore, that perhaps uh, uh, others who are less experienced may find that uh, they have some lessons that they could usefully learn from the Cabinet Secretary's considerable experience. But I wonder if you could, Cabinet Secretary this morning, could indicate what kind of things we as Scotland are looking for from the new uh, DEFRA team down in Westminster uh, and how he sees representational issues developing going forward, given that he now is the most experienced minister uh, across the whole of the UK. Well, th thank you for that question, and quite clearly it's uh, something I'm giving a lot of thought to just now because 
after spending uh, since uh, May 2010 trying to convey Scotland's priorities to DEFRA and putting a huge amount of effort into hopefully making some progress uh, with uh, the DEFRA team, um, as have all our stakeholders. Uh, uh, here we are, to a certain extent, back to square one and having to start from scratch right in the middle of a CAP negotiation uh, and indeed a CFP negotiation uh, with a new, completely new DEFRA team. Uh, not so much the fishing minister, the DEFRA, of course, is continuing the post, but in terms of agriculture, all three ministers um, have been replaced. Uh, so I'm going to be making an extra special effort, as you can imagine, to bring the new team up to speed on Scotland's priorities. Uh, clearly, our priorities are uh, in connection with the budget, whereas we want the cap budget uh, protected as far as possible to meet Scotland's particular needs. We are in a different position to the rest of the UK in terms of our needs, in terms of agricultural profile, given our dependence on the livestock sector, given our uh, extent of less favoured area in Scotland, which is uh, you know, much more uh, so than the rest of the UK which brings extra requirements from the new cap. Uh, and I, I feel that we deserve a better Pillar 1 allocation. Uh, of course, if we were a member state, we'd have a far better Pillar 1 allocation than what we will be as part of the UK, um, irrespective of the outcome of the negotiations. And in terms of Pillar 2, we've addressed that already. I think we deserve a fair, fairer share of Pillar 2. So these will be priorities with the new DEFRA team that I'll be bringing to their attention. Obviously, I've said that I want help for new entrants into Scottish agriculture from day one of the new cap. That will therefore be one of the key priorities I'll be mentioning and raising with the new DEFRA team. And uh, uh, trying to get some common sense injected into the greening proposals, which if they don't change, they will harm... They'll, they'll, or, or many farming businesses will be hamstrung by these proposals if they go ahead uh, unchanged. So that gives you a flavour of some of our key priorities I'll be raising uh, with the Commissioner tomorrow and the new DEFRA team at the beginning of next week in Brussels. I, I, my final point I just want to make is that um, I have been involved quite often proactively uh, with some of the agricultural negotiations. Uh, including in the heat of the moment when we reached the crunch point uh, where we've been able to bring to bear our experience as an administration who's been there at these negotiations uh, since 2007. And I really feel it will be in Scotland's uh, and even perhaps the UK's interests if uh, myself as Scottish Minister and our team are given a prominent role in the forthcoming negotiations. Uh, I have built up relationships with other ministers across uh, Europe and I have a fair idea of where some of the main debates are and how they could perhaps be addressed. And from Scotland's point of view, I think it's absolutely vital that Scotland's in the room when the dotted lines are signed uh, in the forthcoming negotiations. There will be two or three key moments over the next uh, six to eight months, maybe longer, depending on how the negotiations go, where agreements will be made behind closed doors, in the room, with just the presidency, with just the commissioner, and just the, member, the individual member states one at a time. And I strongly believe Scotland has to be in the room with the UK minister, with the presidency, and with the commissioner when some of these decisions are taken and negotiations are made. Cabinet section, I think you've clearly outlined how you know it, crucial it is that our voice is heard. And indeed, I would imagine that for farmers in Scotland, they would absolutely agree because what we see with the UK Tory Liberal government in London is, it seems, at least in terms of the previous DEFRA team and determination to argue for a reduced Pillar 1 uh, settlement. And, of course, that is not what Scottish farmers want. And I'm sure they would be very supportive of having you in the room, Cabinet Secretary, uh, arguing at Scotland's Corner. Thank you, Convener. Any qu further questions on that point? Yes, Claudia Beamish. Then Jim Hume. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, we're all aware that the next three months is particularly important in terms of negotiation of amendments and uh, certainly um, as a member of this committee and also as a Shadow Minister, wish you well with that. Um, particularly in relation to uh, the, the greening of Pillar 1 um, and the Scottish solutions. I wonder if you could say something in a bit more detail about um, the alternatives that might be proposed in relation to crop rotation and permanent pasture and also to ecological focus. And also, um, 
I'm wondering whether um, there's been any modeling and testing um, of the payment arrangements uh, just in relation to how uh, the area, um, area payments would be structured so that we don't find ourselves in, in a worse situation than we might if that hadn't happened. Thank you. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time, as you can imagine, discussing the greening proposals with the UK government uh, in recent months, uh, as well as the, the Commission and other member states. And it would be remiss of me not to pay tribute to the outgoing DEFRA team in terms of Caroline Spellman and uh, Jim Pace, uh, who clearly I had policy disagreements with from time to time, because my job is to put Scotland's interests first. But we certainly got on well, and I felt that we had their ear uh, on most of the issues we wanted to gain their support with, uh, particularly Jim Pace, who I feel that um, his loss was a bit of a shock, uh, not just to the English and Welsh farming sectors, but also to the Scottish farming sectors. Uh, whatever disagreements we may have had over policy issues, uh, Jim Pace and myself got on very well. I like Jim Pace. I felt he was on the same wavelength as the farming sectors um, across these islands. And um, him leaving at this point in time is a, a, a loss and a shock. And you know, I want to wish him all his best uh, for the future of his time in the UK Parliament. But greening was one issue I discussed uh, often with uh, the previous DEFRA team, and we'll be doing so with the, the next DEFRA team, the current DEFRA team. Uh, there are some issues which are particular concern to Scotland, where our needs are simply not being taken into account, where Brussels bureaucrats sitting in their offices uh, clearly have not looked out their window or got on an aircraft often enough and come to Scotland to see our hill farms. Uh, some of them have, and I'm surprised they're not taking into account what they've seen, but they have to do a bit more of that to recognise some of the challenges our particular hill farmers face uh, in terms of the, the crop rule which has been proposed as part of the greening proposals. Uh, clearly there's a number of changes we'd like to see with the greening proposals. I won't go through them all because you asked specifically about the three crop rule, so I'll stick to that. Uh, at the moment, the proposal is that if you have more than three hectares of arable cropping, uh, you have to grow three crops on your farm. Now, clearly, if you're an upland farm in certain areas of Scotland, uh, that is bordering on the impossible. A, there's not much you can grow, uh, and B, you know, the circumstances are just not suitable in terms of the environment uh, for perhaps more than one kind of crop or whatever. Uh, and it could actually jeopardise the environmental value of hill farming that we have at the moment. And there's been a lot of studies recently to, to show that's the case. So it's not in Scotland's environment interest, and it's not in the practical economic interest of hill farming in Scotland for that three crop rule to go ahead as proposed. We would like to see the three hectare limit uh, increased so that this only kicks in if you have, say, more than uh, 20 hectares uh, or whatever. That would give a bit more flexibility to many farms. We would like to see issues like winter and spring barley being treated as separate crops, not as the same crop. We want that kind of flexibility. Um, and, of course, we want to uh, not have a situation where you know a farmer may be forced to grow three different crops in effectively one field, which is what the current proposals would uh, you know, put in place. So there's a lot of change we want to see there in terms of the crop rule. Uh, a lot of the changes we want to see are reflected in some of the amendments put down by Scottish MEPs as far as the European Parliament's contribution is concerned. We've been speaking to the MEPs about that. So we hope some of these amendments are successful. And likewise, we're trying to get the UK government to be on side uh, as well as other member states. I just want to say that, you know, I'm sure the committee is aware of this, but, you know, uh, the current proposals cannot be implemented in Scotland. It's as simple as that. The complexity, the difficulties in actually implementing them, notwithstanding the practical problems that would be faced on farm and the environmental problems that would result as a case of that, as a result of that, means that we just cannot implement these proposals as they stand in Scotland. We can't do it for practical reasons and it'd be damaging, so we just cannot implement them. And that's the strong message we have to give to the European Commission, is they have to waken up and recognise this is highly damaging, and they simply cannot be implemented in Scotland. Uh, and Just the modelling, the modelling question the you asked. In relation to area, um, sorry, yeah. area payments. 
The Brian Pat report clearly did some modelling, which gave us an idea of the impact that the new cap proposals would have in Scottish farming. And we are undertaking new modelling at the moment with uh, the uh, James Hutton Institute to look at how we'd implement new cap in Scotland. The modelling will be in tandem with the time scale for actually knowing what the proposals will be from Brussels. We can't model until we know what the boundaries are. Where the modelling really will kick in is once we have to decide how to implement this in Scotland. That's the importance of the modelling. So we are putting in place steps just now to have this modelling from the James Hutton Institute to look at how we can implement new cap in Scotland. Would it, would it be appropriate, Cabinet Secretary, to have some pilot modelling schemes to, to look at, at the situation so that we can perhaps more strongly, from the Scottish perspective, feed into what the arguments are? Or perhaps that's happened anyway um, in relation to um, the, the first part of the Brian Pack modelling. I don't know. Um, yes, if there's more modelling we can do, I have an open mind for that. All I can say is there's lots of evidence we have at the moment the SEC, the Institute's Scottish Government, the industry, we've all been working together to put forward all the evidence as to why the current greening proposals will not work in the Scottish context. And as I said before, the next level of modelling that has to be carried out is once we have the European proposals, that we have to work out how we want to implement this in Scotland. Thanks very much, Convener. It's looking a bit further in, into this modelling. I believe the Welsh Parliament Assembly has actually uh, done some modelling already, which uh, obviously land users are able to look at, uh, I believe, and uh, are obviously able to start to plan their businesses to change into this new cap. Um, and I, I believe that the Welsh Assembly are also using that as a, 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 as a tool to actually uh, lobby uh, EU with, because therefore they can uh, see what changes. You, you, you're saying you'd wait for the proposals to come out to Europe before you'd go in deeper. Do you not think it was essential that we actually get some serious modelling done now, uh, similar to the experience in, in Wales, where we can use it, one, to help uh, land users uh, plan for the future, and two, lobby Europe to make sure that we have a, a, a cap that's fit for Scotland? Well, I'm happy to take that away and look at whether there's a case for even more modelling than what's been carried out already, and I'm happy to do that. And if we can have a few case study, as uh, Claudia Beamish uh, suggested, um, you know, I will, I will happily commission that. Uh, all I'm saying to you at the moment is please rest assured that there's been modelling already on what would be good for Scotland as part of our negotiations. We're in the middle of commissioning more modelling of how that can actually be implemented in Scotland, taking account of what's being promoted in Europe at the moment. Uh, and what the outcomes we want to see. Um, but, you know, it's a question of trying to uh, understand what you're actually modelling, uh, because you've got to just get the timing right, because there's no point modelling and scenarios are not going to happen. So, but, you know, I'll, I'll take that away and I'll look at what the Welsh Assembly are doing. Yeah, I, I okay. appreciate that. And, and just on a, a final final point for myself, anyway, just other, other uh, countries are talking about... Uh, Transitional periods. I think I think the Irish want a 20-year transition, which is maybe a, a strong bargaining point from their view. What's your own views on a transitional uh, common agricultural policy for Scotland? Well, it's a very good question, and what I have said up to now is that the period of transition will very much relate to how we can help new entrants, because. The strong case for moving to an area basis away from historic, as we all know, is we cannot pay out single farm payments in 2015 or 2020 and what people were doing in 2002. Completely untenable. We have to get away from that system as soon as possible. And the big losers in the current system are new entrants. And I've said that whilst I understand the need to have a transition period, the length of that transition period will be dictated by what extent new entrants are coming on board for a level playing field. If we can get them in early, and they're taken care of, and there's a case for having a, a reasonable transition period in the comfort of new entrants getting a level playing field from day one, then I'm open to that, having that transition period. But if the only way we can get new entrants in from day one is to have a, a quick change over however many years, you know, that would be my preference, because we have to get new entrants onto a level playing field. Uh, and I'm getting conflicting messages from stakeholders on the transition periods. 
Um, I speak to many, many farmers who want an overnight transition, or at least as quickly as possible. And of course, the NFU and others are saying we should perhaps go into 2020 or beyond before we get fully into the new system. Um, I'm loath to take that amount of time. I think the quicker the better, but we have to be realistic about the practicalities of getting to the new system. So that's sort of my answer just now is the quicker the better, but you know we have to take on board the practicalities of actually being able to implement the new system, and that will make that won't happen overnight. Thank you, convener. I absolutely agree with that, um, cabinet secretary, and, and, and I I feel that that underlines the, the, the real importance of what Claudia and Jim Hume were talking about on, on the on the modelling. Uh, of, of any new system. You rightly say that new entrants have been the losers of the historic payment system, and I agree, but there have, of course, and, and will be winners and losers in the transition to a new system of area-based payments as opposed to historic payments. And, and, I mean, would you agree that that really does underline the, 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 the case for exhaustive modelling so that you can then go to Europe as a Scottish government and argue for the flexibility that you will need to implement the new system in, in the way that is most equitable to all of the stakeholders who, who will be involved in this. Well, well, as I said to you before, we are considering there's a need for more modelling, but we have built up a huge amount of evidence as to the impact on Scottish agriculture of the current proposals. And I'm confident we have that evidence. And indeed, the feedback we get is we're ahead of many other countries in Europe in terms of the evidence we have built up. So, you know, I don't want to give, or don't want anyone to give the impression that you know somehow we're behind here in modelling or or building up evidence. I'm quite confident we've built up a lot of evidence. Uh, you know, however, I said I've got an open mind and I'll reflect on the committee's views today. To ask you um, about these negotiations with regard to new entrants, it was mentioned earlier by Margaret McDougall, but. The point that we're making about people building up capital to be able to take on a new farm as a new entrant, and often at the age of 40 is inappropriate now. Indeed, if we're assuming that even the farming population is living longer like the rest of the population, um, this is perhaps a barrier which Europe has placed in our way to actually having good succession and uh, development of the farming industry. Yes. There is a lot of initiative that has to be taken to help new entrants. Some of those relate to the, the cap. The most fundamental parts of the solution remain uh, relate to cap in terms of ensuring single farm payment and other support mechanisms go to anyone who's genuinely active in agriculture, whether they've been involved for a year or 50 years. It doesn't matter. If you're genuinely active, you deserve the support which is available. Uh, and so that's a fundamental part. And the other measures we can take are not necessarily related to CAP, their access to capital, um, there's the growing debate over the potential of share farming in Scotland, and as I said before, we're working with uh, a number of existing new entrants to try and get their views on what's required. I think we've had a very good uh, briefing update at the present time. Um, we're going to seek to uh, video conference with uh, MEPs and find out how these 7,000 amendments <laughs> are coming along. Uh, and uh, after we've uh, spoken to them, we'll maybe get you back uh, to uh, speak about things uh, later in the year on this. Uh, but we look forward to that. And uh, I thank you on behalf of the members for a wide-ranging and comprehensive approach. Thank you. And I should forewarn the committee that we're planning a debate in Parliament uh, in the very near future on the common agricultural policy, a matter of days, I think. So just uh, you'll day. have your opportunity to make the committee's views known, individual uh, party views known, I'm sure. So thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And we'll end this item now. Thank you. And uh, try to move on uh, fairly straight, uh, quickly, I think, to uh, the final item on the agenda. A moment or two to, to change over. Uh, six minutes ahead of time. Um, so we, we move on to agenda item three, uh, petition PE1386 on inshore fisheries management. Now this item 
is for the committee to consider a petition by Richard Mundy on behalf of the Torrid and Nephrops Management Group on inshore fisheries management. And I refer members to the paper which you have with uh, you just now. And I invite comments from members at the present time on the way forward with this petition. Uh, well, convener, oh, thank you. Um, I um, was interested to read the note helpfully prepared by the clerks and also the submission from Dr. Andrea Nightingale. And indeed, in her submission, she wasn't able to attend our round table. She made she raised a number of very interesting points, uh, and I think, therefore, um, and taking into account the excellent round table evidence session that we had, I don't think the issue really is is over. Uh, and I don't think, therefore, that we can simply close it. And I think what we might seek to do is to keep the petition open whilst writing to Marine Scotland to uh, seek their response to the various important issues that were raised at the round table uh, and then consider their response um, uh, in forthcoming uh, meetings and discussions. Any other comments just now? Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, Convener. Yeah, just to say, I mean, obviously this uh, is um, new to me, given that I've just joined the committee. However, uh, I do have some sympathy with uh, with the petition, uh, given that I've seen it firsthand in the Western Isles the damage that can be done uh, to the seabed uh, from uh, well in inshore waters from toad gear. So uh, it's just to put on record that I do have sympathy with this, and uh, I feel it should certainly be uh, continued. That. Um, Claudia Beamish. Um, I would agree with that uh, position, uh, partly because of the, the arguments put forward by Dr uh, Andrea Nightingale, and she, she does highlight in her submission that she received evidence from Sky and um, other places as well, not just from uh, the, the, the petitioners. And um, I think also in view of the fact that we've got the uh, marine protected areas coming up and the National Marine Plan that I would see this in the broader context of concerns about inshore fisheries and how that fits into a sustainable um, coastal uh, approach uh, for, for us in Scotland. So I would be keen to keep it open uh, in view of those issues as well and see it in a broader context. Yeah, I have to declare a constituency interest in a sense, but uh, um, I think that the remarks that have been made allow us to keep uh, the dialogue going if we adopt the approach of keeping the petition open and getting more response from Marine Scotland. So if we're all agreed about that, agreed. Uh, then we should uh, conclude with that particular recommendations. So I would close the meeting now and remind you that the next meeting of the committee is on the 26th of September. Uh, where we will take evidence from the Woodland Expansion Advisory Group and the Land Reform Review Group. Uh, and thank you, members, for your pertinent questions. And uh, we will close this session now.